Thank you. It's really nice to be here. I haven't been in Alberta for a little while. Uh, barley growers meeting maybe in 2013. A little while. But um, it is warmer here this morning than it is back home in Florida this morning. Uh, we had to freeze protect in a lot of places. Uh, unusually cold, record cold this morning. Um, so that's one little burr under my saddle today. But another one was some things that have come up in the news lately. And what's really exciting about this particular talk, I usually like to motivate folks to take action and to start engaging the public and communicating about what we do in, in science and in farming. But what I'd like to do today, I'm a little bit different in that I think I want to show you some things that I hopefully will motivate you from the other side of the spectrum that should make you a little bit angry. Because people who are not scientists, who don't know anything about farming, are controlling the dialogue on science and farming. And we need to be stepping into this a little bit more strongly. We're doing a good job. We see a lot of good things changing. But I think we can do more. And I, I do encourage you, if, if, you're, if you are not yet in social media, talk to me before we leave, and I'll get you connected on Twitter. Really important for your story, for your voice to be heard in this equation. Uh, if all of us participate, it's a very loud voice that will make some impact. So um, as was mentioned before, I'm a, I'm a researcher first. I do research in a variety of areas, uh, in, in, uh, mostly around Florida specialty crops, namely strawberries. We're working on ways to use genomic tools. I'm, I'm a DNA scientist by training. We're trying to get all the right genes in the same place so that we can have higher value uh, crops that help Florida farmers. Uh, we're overcome right now. Our farmers in Florida are fighting against a huge influx of fruit that comes in from Mexico and really drops their prices. So we're working on having superior quality stuff that consumers recognize. Uh, we also do other work in other areas as well. I also have a very strong extension appointment and uh, I'm excited to get out in the field on a regular basis. But what I'll talk about today is uh, really about how you can better participate into closing the divide between what the public thinks about farming and what farming actually is. It's really important because other people, as I mentioned earlier, are controlling that dialogue. Um, I really want to start out, well, we'll talk about this, why it's important. Um, as scientists, we're innovating all the time, coming up with the best new innovations, the best new ideas. The problem is, is that the innovations that we're creating frequently at high taxpayer expense are not reaching the public where they're meant to uh, meant to uh, end up, they're not reaching application. And this is a real frustration because I see many of the tools that I've developed and my colleagues have developed that really die on the vine. These are things that could be really having a huge impact out on the farm, but they're not getting there. And the reason of that is, is because we don't have the social license to use them. And social license is a really important term. It's this uh, kind of uh, prevailing feeling out there that allow, that kind of gives an, a, a tacit um, uh, permission to be able to use the technologies that we want to use. And on the farm, that may be growth regulators, herbicides, uh, other pesticides, safely used. Yet social license is turning against those technologies as well. And against genetic engineering and all of the newest versions of genetic engineering, the stuff called gene editing, which is coming and it's going to be huge. It's going to radically change medicine and agriculture. But will we be able to use it? Right now, it looks like we will, but that can change at any moment. So there's never been a time that's more critical for us all to be involved in this conversation than the present. We have to make sure that everything's moving in the right direction. I want to change things around a little bit from how I normally do them today, because I want to start by talking about the audience that we're seeking to speak to. Um, we're very good at speaking with each other. And as you begin to see more farmers and scientists taking roles in social media, you see us speaking with each other on a regular basis. We're preaching to the choir. And it's important to preach to the choir, because sometimes the choir even needs but more information. But we're not reaching into the congregation of skeptics, the people that view uh, science and farming as things that are potentially harming their families, right? I mean, you've seen all the, seen all the rhetoric. So how do we take, play, take a part in that conversation? And that's what we'll talk about today. The audience is really the first thing that we need to worry about. Um, the audience can really be broken down into a couple different pieces. There's that little red portion of the pie. That's us. 
We're the people that understand what we do and why we do it. And also a small number of consumers that have very good ideas about what food and farming and the science surrounding it really is. Those folks are wonderful. We have a small number, a very small number, of people that say because of modern farming techniques, the sky is falling. That we have to revert to the way we did things a thousand years ago, right? You've seen all these conversations. But that's a very, very small number of people. The majority of people are in that blue portion of the pie. They don't know who to trust. They don't know what to believe. And so why the people in that red portion of the pie are good at talking to people in the red portion of the pie. We're not speaking to the people in the blue portion of the pie. Who's talking to them? The folks in the yellow portion of the pie. So you can see the problem we're up against. We're busy talking to each other about something that we're all very well versed in and learning more and getting better at it. But we're not speaking to the people who ultimately will affect social license. And we need to start talking to them. Other people are talking to them. Um, this is, uh, it just came out this week. Uh, last week, uh, December 6th, so what, six days ago, um, in The Guardian, a major newspaper in uh, England, or, uh, in the UK, that has circulation all over the world via the internet. And um, this article came out. And uh, it, it's, uh, the weed killer in our food is killing us. And this is with respect to glyphosate. And this is Aaron Brockovich. And you can see here, um, growing research shows that glyphosate, one of the most widely used herbicides in the US and Canada, causes cancer. Here's Erin Brockovich. You see the movie? You know, she seemed like a, she's very well regarded. She uh, did some excellent things with respect to uh, protecting the public from, uh, from environmental toxins that were kind of being put under the table. Things like hexavalent, chromium hexavalent. Um, She's widely regarded as somebody who is a warrior on behalf of the little guy and someone who is, in, who is working hard to protect the environment and protect people from it. But here, in this very visible article, she lies. False information, flat out. A very, very trusted person spreading false information that directly affects agriculture. There's no evidence that glyphosate causes cancer, scant evidence at best. Nothing reflected in epidemiological data we looked at this very carefully. I've looked at this carefully for 30 years. Uh, the weed killer in our food. If you look at what's actually detected in food, it's, it's barely there. And if it is there, it's measured by laboratories with activist agendas. And, and re legitimate laboratories don't find the same thing. So let's look at a couple more things from this particular article. Um, this slide here. Uh, Almonds, carrots, quinoa, and beets are just some of the foods that contain high level of glyphosate. How many of you have ever sprayed glyphosate on carrots? <laughs> I mean, they don't do too well after you do that. I mean, um, maybe in almonds, they may use it in row middles and orchards to, make, to, to control weeds and other things in orchards. But uh, there's very, very unlikely that you would ever find any of this stuff on things like carrots or beets. There's reasons why they say that. Um, another part here, uh, growing research suggests a link to cancer. There's no growing evidence that shows a link to cancer. This is Erin Brockovich. She's giving false information that's his best cursory information. Maybe some uh, loose associations that came out in the literature in 2003 that since the better studies have shown don't, don't hold up. But this is a very well-respected person who's making these assertions in a very powerful medium. Um, another one here. Um, we need to petition our legislatures, exercise our right to vote, and our communities rally behind what we believe in. So not what the science says, but what we believe, what we believe to be the case. We need to get the mob together and with pitchforks and torches, go to our legislatures and change it. It turns out that Aaron Brockovich is really representing, this is the irony here, a very uh, well-financed, a very um, uh, organized set of folks who now are working against agricultural chemistry. Multi, multi, hundreds of millions of dollars. So she no longer is fighting for the little guy. She's representing the big money interests in a legal world, which she's now targeting agriculture. And not exactly saying that in the article, by the way. Um, she, um, here it turns out, uh, she works for Weizen Luxembourg. 
a law firm that now is hiring attorneys to, um, and the next slide I think it shows it here, um, work on litigation in Roundup. So here is this hero who now has taken on this new mantle of working with multi-million dollar litigation, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars in litigation, to now go after agricultural chemistry. And her microphone is a major paper where she doesn't say she works for a law firm. She says she's fighting for the little guy. You see what we're up against here? This is why social license is eroding and why trust in food and agriculture is, is eroding is because the people who are trusted have a bad message, a false message. They're propagating misinformation. And what are we doing to stop that? I've spent a lot of time over the years doing this and I've written an article about this that will go live hopefully this week. Um, I've dealt with the wheat belly guy too, and the brain drain or whatever, grain brain guy, same guy. Uh, he was uh, advertising on PBS in my town, and I called in and said, get this off the air. How do you have, you know, that, but that's a whole other story, a public radio, a public television, promoting a person who's lying about food and farming. And that's my taxpayer dollars. So this is, uh, this is where we all need to be more active in telling these stories and telling your story about how it really is. None of us will ever have the stage that Erin Brockovich has. But there's more of us than there are of her. And we can be trusted. And now we can actually go on offense and work to actively erode the trust that she's exploiting to spread a false message. Oh, here's the article in the paper. The same, uh, the same law firm that she uh, 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 represents is actively soliciting people to come in and say, have you ever used Roundup? Do you have some sort of uh, problems, health problems? Well, come talk to us. We'll find you some money. Uh, this is where this is. And, and what's the point of all of this? I mean, I, oh, here's a great slide. This is off their website where they show uh, somebody uh, applying uh, glyphosate Roundup uh, may cause cancer. Um, there's no uh, evidence of that clinically or epidemiologically. Um, but uh, here's somebody who looks like they're walking through carnations or something with Roundup or with spraying something. Um, obviously, that would kill them all if that was the case. So they're lying everywhere. It is totally misleading. And, uh, and this is the kind of thing that goes unchallenged. Right now, all of us should be on our phones tweeting, look at this slide of someone who allegedly spraying glyphosate on carnations. This would kill them. It shows the misinformation that is being used to promote this activist agenda. You know, this needs to be our message. We need to be spreading that information and showing this kind of deception to the people in the blue portion of the pie, the people who don't know what to trust. Here people are scaring the hell out of them, and no one's there to say, hold on, that's deceptive. If they were actually doing that, it would kill those plants. That's not glyphosate. Why do you believe anything these people are telling you? That's the message we need to be telling and we're not really doing it very long. We can do better. So the, the, why are they bothering to do this? And what is their goal? Well, there's a lot of money involved in this. Hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to be had in legal trials. We've seen some of this happening already in the states. Um, there's hopeful, hope to affect policy. How can you have different compounds? And I know this is the case in Canada as well, in different provinces, uh, have specific farm inputs limited or banned their use. Um, this is what a lot of people would like to see. We also know that there's, um, the idea here is to change social, life, social license. If you can get people to fear their food by telling them that it's poison, now you have ways to get them to carry your message. You now have the influence of that blue portion of the pie. This is what we're up against, and this is why they're doing it. It's all about trust. Who has the trust? Aaron Brockovich had the trust. Do we have the trust? I know that when I try to get in and have these discussions, there's people who actively try to take away the trust that I build, very successfully sometimes. But this is why it's so important for all of us to be involved in this conversation. We have to do this individually, each one of us. If there's, there's, what, 350 voices in this room that if we all were active on a regular basis, and it doesn't have to be hours a day, we can change the course of this conversation, but we all have to be there. One of the things that we have to, to um, get through our heads, and this is a problem that, that scientists have horribly, and farmers too, is we tend to communicate in facts. We 
tend to communicate about this is the way I do it, this is um, how it works, uh, this is what we do, right? What we do and, and, and how we do it. We're good at that. We have to be better at talking about why we do it. Why is it important? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to our families, to the environment, to the country? Why? We have to focus more on why. The big reason that works is because psychologists tell, tell us that facts don't matter. Facts don't matter. And I made this mistake for years as a scientist, especially in my early days. I used to go in and beat people over the head with data. I'd say, well, look at the graph. Look right here. Look at the statistical differences here. I used to do that all the time. And guess how many hearts and minds I'd change, especially in a public forum? Even zero. But facts, they don't matter until you establish trust. And once you establish trust, now people are willing to listen to what you say. And this is why it's really a little bit of a barrier for us, is because we deal in a different language. We speak scientist to scientist, farmer to farmer, sometimes scientist to farmer. And we speak in a language of facts and evidence, and that's where we're most comfortable. We don't want to talk to the public about what we do. We chose these careers because we liked being with people like us when we had to talk to anybody at all, right? I look across the faculty in my department, and they would rather sit in front of a computer and write grants and papers because that's what they do, and that's what we've selected for as an industry or as, as an academic practice. Hire people who are good at raising money to do more research, not people who are good at talking to the public. So we have to get through this idea that we have to start earning trust. And Maya Angelou is the Nobel laureate who has uh, said these words. is really important. I've learned that people will forget what you said, forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So it's not about facts. It's about how you make them feel. And how did Aaron Brockovich make people feel by telling them that their food, their carrots, their beets, their quinoa was loaded with chemicals that are killing them? It's all about how you can change the way people feel. The problem is, is that this is an asymmetrical debate right now. It's folks like Brockovich and folks from that environmental working group, all of these other agencies and the NGOs, maybe a few people, who are guiding this conversation and garnering the trust by using fear. And we're not out there talking about the good things that agriculture does to produce the safest, most abundant, most vibrant food supply in human history. That's what we need to be talking about. So how do we win that trust back? And that's what we'll talk about today. And in the next uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes, we'll talk about how we earn trust and how we get people to think about these things the way we do. And what's really interesting is that it changes if you, if you take what I'm going to show you here today and use this in your real life, you find that it changes your personal relationships, it, even ones that are really ancient, you know, the way you, you speak with important people around the house, the way you interact with your boss, the way you buy a car. Um, I learned this stuff as a scientist just by having to uh, pay attention to psychologists, and not just psychologists I would visit for help, uh, psych people who are experts in psychology. Um, this has been a very difficult couple of years. People in psychology, sociology, all of these disciplines around universities that we always kind of looked at sideways and says, hey, does that really matter? Yeah, it does. Because they study how people think and how people react to our messages. And they tell us how we do it wrong. So it's really important to speak to those kinds of people and understand where they are. And so I've read a lot of their books and started to learn more about what the science of science communication is and the science of agricultural communication. So that's what we'll talk about here. We'll talk about three books, uh, Never Split the Difference. We'll talk about a book called, um, well, Never Split the Difference, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and uh, something called um, Hug Your Haters. And these three books were really enlightening to me because they taught me how I was doing the wrong thing when I was trying to earn trust of the people in that blue portion of the pie. And I really do believe that at, you know, at the end of this conversation, if you can apply what we learn from these authors, you'll find that you can have very productive conversations that really shift uh, the folks that we need to influence, the people who don't know who to trust, and say, trust us, because we're telling you the truth not like the people who have the front page of The Guardian. So this idea of thinking fast and slow is a book by Dan Kahneman, and what he talks about is the way that we process information. 
Humans process information in kind of a funny way, a couple of different ways, because our brains are a little more complex than even closely related animals. Um, Kahneman tells us that there's two parts of our brain, and he calls them system one and system two. And system one is this emotional and erract, inter, uh, 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 irrational, uh, very rapid part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that where fear settles in. This is a, a very emotional part of the brain. This is the part of the brain that if you, uh, evolutionarily, if you heard something rustling in the, in the bush, you'd grab the children and run the other way. It's that thing called the reptile brain. You know, we refer to it that way. It's the part that protects us and helps us find food and protect our families. That's the fast reaction, right? The other part of the brain is what Kahneman calls system two. And system two is slow. It's logical. It weighs all of the variables and comes out with the best outcome. This is the part of the brain that maybe didn't serve us well through uh, evolution in some ways, because if we heard a rustling in the bush, we'd go look inside and say, what is it? Sometimes that didn't work so well. But it's the same, it's the same part of the brain that separates us and other great apes from many of the other animals, in that it allows us to have this level of cognitive function and integration of information to analyze and understand uh, the outcome of a situation. So look at it this way. Um, when you read that Aaron Brockovich thing on the front of the Guardian saying that your food is killing you, that's appealing to system one. You and I go into that same conversation and say, well, let me tell you about how this works. You know, we only apply 0 0.750 liters of glyphosate per acre, and we understand its half-life is here, and we only do it up to this stage on the planet. You know, we come at it with the evidence and the facts, but that isn't going to influence the way people feel, because that system one brain is in charge, that reptile brain is being appealed to. And we come at it with this other message. It doesn't work. It's because we're trying to overcome that, uh, that emotional, scared uh, brain in the folks who are getting those messages. The other problem we have is tribal behavior. And people do break into tribes, um, as we have for uh, millions of years now, well, hundreds of thousands of years. The idea is, is that we tend to like being with people who are like us. And this is what we're trying to overcome in these conversations about food and farming, are these kind of cliques that form about uh, how people want to be fed and where their food comes from. Um, we know that people rely on tribes to reinforce their ideas, even if they don't necessarily agree with all of the ideas of their tribe. And we see this very, uh, very pronounced in politics. We know that people really anchor their deepest held beliefs based upon other tribal values and other tribal beliefs. We also have so, tribes are so important that we even make them up. And we even come up with tribes and build trust with people in those communities more than we would with someone in a different community, you know? And you see this a lot with sports. You know, you'd rather, have, you'd rather uh, uh, trust somebody who's wearing the same jersey as your favorite team than someone from the other team. And so these are the two big barriers that we have to overcome. Emotional, irrational thinking, that reptile brain, and our tribal tendencies which are very deeply ingrained in, in the way that we behave. So how do we do it? And what are some of the ways to do it? And what it means is we have to change our messaging. And this is, it took me a long time to figure this out, but it's actually pretty easy. How do we deal with somebody who's in an emotional state who's about to make a bad decision? And this is a really important um, book that, I, that changed the way that I think about these things forever. And it was a book by a guy named Chris Vox. Uh, he uh, was a hostage negotiator that saw that the way that they were negotiating with hostage takers wasn't working. It used to be that you would make demands of the hostage taker. You would use strong arm techniques. You would have snipers and smoke grenades. You'd have concussion grenades and SWAT teams that would try to free hostages. What Voss decided to do was use psychology instead. And instead of having these kind of strong arm tactics, came in a lot softer and would say to the hostage taker, Tell me about why you're here. What exactly happened over the last few months to you personally? Like, what are you feeling? And, and what happened? You know, this is the kind of soft, touchy-feely approach that scientists and farmers aren't necessarily good at. But this is uh, what Voss realized was able to free more hostages more successfully. Part of it was empathy and listening. And, and those are words that we never learned in science. Um, we thought, well, why do we care? We're, we're, you know, we, we have the data, we have the evidence. Why do we need to listen to other people? Well, we have to listen because people are concerned. 
And what we have to do first, and, and so many of us have done this, and we've gone into places where we've had an audience of the public who says, we want to know more about our food and farming, and, and, and uh, the science behind it, and say, listen, you know, if you guys don't get it, then, you know, you're, you know, I heard one faculty member from my department say, if they don't get it, they're just stupid. We have to understand that these are people who are protecting their families and protecting their own health. They're concerned about their food and the things they've read online, the things that credible sources like Aaron Milakovic have told them. These are people who just want to, who are, don't know who to trust. And now how do we get, to, how do we earn their trust? The first step is listening and saying, what is it that bothers you? What is it that, that um, makes you concerned about the way that we do this and the way that we raise crops? We have to listen to their concerns. And there's a couple of cool things that Voss talks about, and I would, I would encourage you to download the audio book on this rather than the written book because they tell the stories about how this is, how it works. It's really pretty amazing. And it'll make you a better negotiator, whether it's whether you're negotiating with the kids about where you're gonna go for dinner or whether you're negotiating uh, the price on a new car. This book is gold. And part of it is just uh, the way you interact with someone you're trying to change their mind. First step is listening and understanding where they are. A big way that you show your listening is through this idea of intellectual charity. And I'll give you a good example of that. Um, I'll talk to a mom in a grocery store and she'll be you know, looking at tomatoes and shaking her head. And I'll say, well, what's wrong with the tomatoes? And she'll say, I don't want these GMO tomatoes that are covered in chemicals. Well, and instead of saying, um, well, you know, you're wrong, I understand exactly what the, those are. They're not genetically engineered, and I know exactly what chemicals we use, and I can tell you the ounces per acre that are on them. I'll tell her, um, well, obviously you must have seen the websites that talk about fish genes that are in tomatoes and that uh, make them un unsafe and unhealthy. Uh, maybe you've read about the herbicides that are applied to agricultural crops, and that's really got you concerned. And you'll hear them say, yeah, that's it, that's it. You build a better argument than they can about the things they're concerned about. That's what intellectual charity is. You basically build their argument for them. And it shows them that you're listening, that you understand their concerns, you know what's going on in their heart. Once you've done that, now you can step in and talk about what you know and why you do what you do why there are no fish genes in tomatoes and that it's from, and that there is very limited herbicide applied or insecticide applied. You can talk about the facts after you show them that you're listening. It gives them a sense of power and control in that conversation. And when they have that, they feel um, not like you're lecturing them, but that you're having this conversation based upon their concerns, their legitimate concerns, right? These are people who don't know who to trust. They don't know who to trust, and we want them to trust us, so we have to listen to them first. That's one big part of it. Um, the other big part of this is that the way we change it is by our ethics and values, and we can turn to Aristotle, who taught us all about this. Um, Aristotle reminded us that good persuasion, the way you change someone's mind, has three components, pathos, ethos, and logos. And somewhere right in the middle there is our perfect argument. Now you can start to see system one and system two thinking here, right? Pathos is feelings. Let's so think about empathy and sympathy, that kind of thing. Pathos, um, that's feelings. That's where Erin Brockovich targets when she says, your, the wheat killer in your food is causing cancer. Scientists go for logos. Farmers go for logos. Well, that's ridiculous. We can look back to De Roos 2003, which was a case control study. And then the better follow-up studies in 2005 showed uh, that the statistical correlations they had at a 95% confidence interval were completely unfounded. You see, that's where scientists come from. And that doesn't change that mom's idea, you know, about that tomato or about any kind of produce question, any kind of farm question. So you can see that set up as pathos versus logos, system one versus system two, right? Our logical way of doing things versus the emotional way, the heart versus the head, and the heart always wins until we go to ethos. And this is where this room has this in, in buckets. We have ethos, our ethics, our, our, our background, our competence, why we do what we do, why we do it, why we decide to, to make a living by feeding people safe and nutritious food, using the proper inputs, 
uh, being mindful of resources because it's land that we need to protect to hand it to the next generation. That's ethics, that's ethos, that's the stuff that we need to talk about if we're going to change their minds. And the way we overcome the, the, the fear-based messaging is by our messages from ethics and then relying on values. So whenever I have these conversations, like the conversation with that mom in the grocery store, I'll say, let me tell you about what's important to me as a scientist and why I work in a university. I could have worked in a company. I could make three times the money and have a much better schedule. But I choose to work in a university because I want to work with people one-on-one -on -one and do, study the questions I want, to, I want to look at. And I want to be able to tell the truth about food and farming. And, um, and leading with my ethics. Talking about my 30 years of experience in the field that I'm in. Um, this is how we have that conversation. I also talk about the values that are most important to me. The things that are most important to me and my things I get concerned about. The reason I put, the why, right? Not, not what, not how, which I did for years, but why I do it. And I do what I do every day for a couple reasons. I'm worried about the North American farmer. And I'm worried about regulations and competition that will challenge our ability to do what we do in the future. I worry all the time about the people in the developing world who have minimal resources, who are, are doing much better but have a long way to go. And how can our technologies, especially our genetic engineering technologies, get there faster? Um, I worry a lot about the North American consumer. The North American consumer has lots of choices, better than ever before, but doesn't make the right choices about food. So how do we make food taste better and get messages to them about, uh, about how to make it last longer and ensure that everything we produce gets into somebody's stomach? That's something I'm worried about, too. And the other thing is the environment. You know, we are dealing with, a, 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 we, we're not getting any more land for farming, and we have to be careful with our resources. We have to protect water. We know that. So when I talk to somebody about why I do what I do and why I care about this, it's because of farmers, consumers, the environment, and the food insecure. That's why I do it. And when that mom in the grocery store hears about that, that I'm worried about the same things she's worried about, the health of our families, now that information can flow. It, it isn't about me beating her over the head with facts. It's, it's much, much, much easier than that. We don't need to talk about facts. We just have to talk about our values, what's important to us, and how technology and how the things we do in farming and science can help those things uh, reach the consumer and, and, our and influence the things we value most. That's what's so important about the messaging. And for years, I did it completely wrong. So this is all about the finding the right audience, talking to the person in the blue portion of the pie, um, listening carefully, understanding where they're coming from, having empathy, understanding their concerns, and then leading with our ethics, talking about our values. This is completely different than the way that we're trained to talk to people, right? We're always talking about just the facts. It isn't about facts. It's about the values we hold and how what we do and why we do it reinforce those values. That's how we influence that conversation. So the last part of things I'll talk about today is where we have to participate. We talked about how we do it, now we'll talk about where. And whether we like it or not, the dominant part of this conversation is taking place in social media. And we have to be able to be in that space, not just social media, but in the media. We need to be part of it. We need to become the media. We need to be interacting with our, our friendly media outlets better. We need to be providing content to those outlets so that they're sharing your story and they will do that. So let's talk about that for just a minute. There's two main ways that you can participate in the media. You can either develop content or you can amplify content. And this is the power of this. And this is real. That if you have a thousand followers, say Facebook or Twitter, which you can do pretty easily, Instagram, thousand isn't that hard. And you share something you wrote about what happened this week on the farm. And your 1,000 followers share that with 1,000 people. Your message has now reached a million people. 350 people in the room, 355, 350 million uh, points of influence that we could create just from this morning, if we chose to do it. That's starting to get up there in that Guardian uh, article with 25,000 shares. You know, we're starting to get into that region now. So we can have that influence and that gravitas. We just have to do it. 
So let's talk a little bit more about that. Content, many opportunities for content. And even though blogging seems so 2010, uh, it's something that you can do. And writing every day about what happens on the farm, what's part of the operation, the recipes that are happening in your home, uh, the uh, people you're having conversations with, current issues that you're facing in regulation, all of these things, that may, you may think, how mundane, you know, I don't think anybody would have an interest. But in this age where people in that blue portion of the pie are seeking out who to trust, they're looking for your content. And we're not giving it to them. The other folks are. They will trust you by understanding what you do and the challenges you face. The things that you think are just mundane that nobody really cares about, yes, somebody does care because they realize you're a human being who's running a tight operation, who's making ends meet, and making it work. It's so oftentimes having to go to extreme measures to do so. Share that story. Share that story. Earn their trust. Um, the articles can go on Medium. You can put articles in many different places these days that will give you a very wide audience for your work. And other times you can just take uh, maybe a current article that you saw somewhere, um, like that Brockovich article. Write about that. Write about how she gets it all wrong and you don't use glyphosate on carrots. And that she's working for a law firm that's involved in the litigation and doesn't talk about that anywhere after this whole article she writes that's mostly false information. That's the kind of information that can help us earn trust. The other, and, uh, some of the places that I do this, so this magazine called Cook's Cook, 1.2 million uh, subscribers, um, people who are mostly foodies, and folks who are probably shopping at places uh, where they've been scared into shopping there because they've been told they're being poisoned by their food. Um, I wrote an article about genetic engineering and all the things that we could have done but we don't do because of fear of technology. And it was written from a very values-based position. Here's what's important to me, farmers, consumers, the environment, and these food insecure. And here's things that we can do to fix it, but we don't, because people are afraid of technology. Um, I write for physicians, and I don't get paid for this. I just do it because it needs to be done, and I need to get out of my tribe and into those tribes. That's what I got. That's where we have to be. It's a good example of how to get in the other tribes. Uh, physicians, nurses, dietitians, people who are at ground zero of lots of questions about the, the chemicals that we use and the inputs and the and uh, the, the genetics. Um, they don't know those answers, and no one's there to tell them except for uh, special interests and people who are opposed to food and farming. So we need to be there for them too. Um, I write a lot of articles for agricultural audiences, especially around the topic of gene editing, which is this revolutionary technology. Uh, it's important that everybody in agriculture knows exactly what this is, and is speaking to their lawmakers and speaking to their communities about it, because it's coming. It's already here in a lot of cases. And uh, this is going to be a huge thing going forward, and we need to make sure everybody's on board. Um, I do a weekly podcast that has quite a, quite a good following now, and it's a permanent archive of information about this. So you can, I mention this just because, you know, I'm, I'm an idiot who sits at home on Saturday morning with a microphone on his desk and talks into it. And then I pay $20 a month to have a website to post it to. It's that simple. And, and if I can do it, I mean, anyone can do it. And everyone should do it because we're generating content, maybe not to develop a big following of people to follow it, but when that mom goes home from the grocery store and gets online and says, is that guy right? She goes there and she's going to find all the bad information. Let her stumble into some good information too. Create the content. Lead a popcorn trail for those concerned folks to find. The other big part if you don't want to create content is to generate amplification of good content. And so um, it works pretty well. Follow other people. Have a Twitter account. Have a professional Facebook account. A professional Instagram account. Um, and not just the ones you talk to friends and family, but a, one that represents your business. Use it. Use it to, if you don't even write anything on there, use it to amplify the other message of trusted people who are operating in those social media spaces to spread positive messages about agriculture. So that's, it's really critical. That's how that one message turns into a thousand. It's because we have good networks. And the bad guys know this, and they exploit that, and we don't. Here's a good example. Um, this is an actual Twitter conversation. Um, it's actually a network diagram of a Twitter conversation. And um, what, what you see here 
um, and I don't have a pointer handy, but if you look at that uh, little node on the bottom left-hand corner, that one little red dot, it puts out a story and it goes into this network and goes everywhere else. You want to be part of that network, amplifying that original content. You can see in the, uh, right above that on the lower left-hand corner, those little dots where there's this one line between them. That's us traditionally. Farmer talking to farmer, scientist talking to farmer, you know, you know, back and forth. You have to be amplifying into that major network. And that's the way we get our messages out. There's a lot of people who do good work in this space. Um, a lot of people who are farmers. I know Sarah Schultz and her family are not far from here. Um, there's a lot of folks who have blogs that we can share their content. Brian had a picture of um, a sunset in the hubcap of his truck that got a million, uh, <laughs> a million views. Something so simple. Uh, can have a tremendous impact. Um, no Ideas Media, they're um, in, in here in Alberta. Um, Nick Syke does a really nice job of distilling scientific topics and does a really good job at making them funny and interesting and, and really uh, entertaining. And he takes on many of the current contemporary issues in agriculture and inputs. And if you were to go ahead and take a look at those, and you don't have to come up with your own videos and your own information. Nick already did that. Share his stuff. Share his stuff with other people. Share the entertaining side of scientific messaging and agricultural messaging with those skeptical audiences because I think this is a way to really influence that blue portion of the pie. Um, get involved on Twitter. There's many academics who are finally doing it, many farmers who finally are doing it. I see a lot, of, a lot of folks out there now, and it's much different than it was five years ago. We've got a good toehold, but we can do better. Um, the last thing I'll talk about um, is it's not always fun and games, and there's a certain level of decorum that we need to maintain in this space. The big pushback for uh, folks in ag, especially um, ranchers and, and animal producers, they're not terribly excited to get involved. They'll say, ah, it's somebody else's problem. I don't need to do it. I don't want to deal with idiots online. I don't want to get into arguments online. It's not about that. Remember who we're trying to influence. We're not there to argue with the opposition. We're there to show the people in the middle who don't know who to trust who we are. And this is where we can use social media and those kind of contentious situations to show that we are the ones that should be trusted. And this comes from the book uh, Never, um, Hug Your Haters by Jay Bayer. And Jay's a really good guy. He does um, uh, customer service training. And I saw him give a talk once, he's really good. Um, he reminds us that the internet is a spectator sport. And for every person who's putting a, an art, a note in that uh, Brockovich article on The Guardian, there are thousands who are reading those notes. So one person comments, thousands read it. Um, we always have to respond with class and always take the high road when we do it. That's how we earn trust. And I always show this example. This is an example from Yelp. Uh, someone went to a restaurant, didn't have a good time. It went to Taste of Venice. Food was awful, service horrible. If you think this is Italian food, go home and open a jar of Prego, you'll be happier. Might taste like Venice if you drink the canal water. I'll never eat there again, right? Unhappy customer. So what does the chef who owns the restaurant do? Well, he goes on Yelp and says, well, uh, obviously you don't know anything about Italian food. It's my family's restaurant. Hope you never return. We don't need people like you here. So in true internet form, you know, you hit me, I hit you. And, 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 and this is what it escalates into. We've all seen this, and it's all, this is the way that non-productive conversations happen. How could you do this different with listening, values, and giving Fact, factful messages based on listening and values. What if he said this? Yeah. I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Meals out should be special times, and I understand why you're disappointed. My family has run this business for 15 years, and satisfaction is our first priority. There's our values, right? My ethics, my family has owned this. We've always worried about this. This is something we prize. Then he says, um, we'd like to try again. Come in and ask dinners on me. I'd like to sit down and learn what you found objectionable. I want to listen to you. I want to listen to you and understand what was wrong. And then the solution, we always hope we can make it better. This is how you answer those kinds of comments. And even though somebody will say, you're just an idiot who's paid by Monsanto to write positive comments, and, um, we're talking to the blue portion of the pie. And when they see us answering with respect, and we're taking the high road, even when we're under attack, speaking from that side with our ethics shining through, that's the way we influence that part of the pie. 
that's the way we show people who to trust, that we own the high road. That's where we are. And we're not gonna we're not gonna take that other side. That's how we win this conversation, and that's how we influence uh, this conversation. Oh, here's a good example. I gave a talk in Saskatoon this summer, um, and uh, someone put up uh, over 2,500 2, signatures calling for investigation on punk Kevin Fulta. Um, they, uh, there's, you know, as usual, people will try to figure out how to uh, get me taken out of the equation. They want me fired from the university. They petition my university all the time to do that. Um, they wrote this, and then they tagged, hashtag conference. So everybody at the conference would say, that guy on the stage, don't listen to anything he's talking, he's telling you. Um, I responded, um, this is a great lesson. I'm at this conference and activists are polluting the conference Twitter stream with disparaging comments using this hashtag. Don't let this deter you from communicating. It's a very low tactic. And then they erased it. Erased it. So when I showed that this isn't going to bother me, this is going to empower me. It's going to show everybody what we're up against. Keep communicating anyway even though you're going to get attacked for it. That message wins the trust. So much so that this person erased that first message. Pretty cool. And then, uh, then, um, then you know, basically even turned it around more that said, these are the folks that represent you. These are the tactics that represent you. Uh, if you are caving into that kind of philosophy. So you see, I basically did judo on them. I took their momentum and I used it against them to build the trust that they were trying to take away. This is more of this. This is how we can use the strategies and the psychology to get what we need out of these conversations. So I'll conclude here. Um, identify your audience. Make sure you're not just preaching to the choir. And remember that facts don't matter until you establish trust. And that effective communication is based on empathy and listening and showing people that you care about them and you care about their concerns before they're going to listen to anything that you have to say. Uh, scientists and academics were good at talking to each other, but we need to get out of our tribe. Create content for something else. Um, generate content and amplify the work of others. Develop and expand your social media networks. Use your networks to share the good information of others. Um, always handle criticism and conflict with absolute class. Represent farming, represent science. Show our ethics and who we really are. That's how we win this conversation. The most important part is to use the power of the pen. Use your voice, the stories of your experience, why you do what you do, and then exploit those networks of social media to get those messages out there. Certainly the Guardian and certainly Aaron Brockovich can do that. Certainly all of, all of the folks want to end the use of genetics and different inputs in farming, they know how to do it. We need to be in exactly that same space. So I will stop there. Um, I have time for questions, I believe, so thank you very, very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. anyone has questions and also I'll try and keep up to date on my uh, latest tweets if you have a question you can do it through Twitter which would be a great experience and uh, a way of uh, you know uh, practicing your social media uh, skills uh, we really appreciate your practical tips I think that sometimes uh, you know we get caught up in that social media world and it's hard to step away and have the practical tips and so we, we appreciate your insights on that and I think we've got oh I should have known John would be first to the microphone come on John uh, tell us what you have for hey, Kevin uh, Kevin thanks for the presentation I think uh, certainly different than when we're worried about our production practices and marketing and whatnot, so I do appreciate that. It, it seems to me that the frame we have discussions around agriculture and agricultural technology and food has been shifted in a significant way. Um, and, and you've talked about our assumptions, our science-based or fact-based approach. My question is, how do you get that big shift to change the conversation and you're talking about incremental you know you're saying 
show what you do, um, listen, be friendly. But that's not a Trumpian moment. So could you talk about how could we shift um, the frame? Because right now it's, it's a defensive battle. And I think somehow we need to get away from that. Yeah, if you're 100% right. And it is, and I, 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 the, the term Trumpian really rings a bell there because it, there's nothing that just has that visibility and bravado of saying this is the way it is, you know, regardless. Uh, we don't have the celebrity advocates, the, uh, the uh, uh, folks who are elevated getting into this conversation. I don't know that, there, that it'll ever happen. I don't know that we'll ever have a, you know, when, someone with Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, you know, insane visibility, speaking on behalf of food and farming. There's some people who are good at that, who are getting that kind of attention, but not nearly at the level it needs to happen. I think that this is a grassroots trust building exercise. Um, some of the folks who have done a really nice job with this, um, um, I try to remember the organization now, maybe it was Saskatoon Lee who did License to Farm. Uh, that was very, very well done. But it didn't get a lot of penetration. It floats out there in YouTube space, and nobody sees it. Who needs to see it? We need to be sharing it on a regular basis. Um, so it, it is more of a much more of a grassroots effort, unfortunately. But does that add to the authenticity of it then, if it's grassroots? It's because that's is that important too, and the whole conversation is the authentic. And, and that's an excellent point. Is that you know the the other side of this? They claim to be grassroots and authentic, and this is the little guy, you know, David and Goliath story when actually they are quite the Goliath um, when you look at the amount of resources they have so it is about us being authentic sharing our stories and, and that way we earn the trust uh, I should have known you'd jump to the microphone too go ahead Robin yeah, hi Kevin hi, Robin. Um, I just wanted to bring attention to the farmers in the room here this whole cancer glyphosate is largely stemming from IARC uh, and I want you to comment on that and we're bringing Dr. David Zarouk from Belgium to Edmonton and Red Deer on February 12th, which is Canada Ag Day. But I just wanted you to just highlight uh, some of the corruption inside the IARC study on glyphosate, how bad that was, and how that's being used as a springboard for the litigation, because we are on the ropes right now with respect to, to glyphosate. That's no, an excellent point. I, I wish I had the time to go into all the detail. But when you look at the foundation of that IARC decision, so the IARC is a division of the World Health Organization that evaluates individual compounds for their potential to cause cancer. And they shifted glyphosate into a probable carcinogen. They did this with very scant data, um, paying attention only uh, to certain articles and ignoring other ones. They don't do any testing. They simply evaluate the literature. They ignored 30, 35 years, 40 years of regulatory information from com or com companies and countries all over the world. It turns out that the key people involved in this were being paid by some of these legal firms, um, 160,000 dollars, 160,000 euros um, uh, under the table at the time um, to influence these decisions. So there, it's all about corruption. It's all about influence that they say is us. Um, but actually, they're the ones who are actually uh, uh, making big money by uh, shaping these conversations and shaping regulation around them using the court system. Uh, David Zarek is outstanding, and he will really, he knows the details of all of the interactions at the legal level in, in Europe and other places around those decisions. So yeah, definitely was, was, was a bad, bad decision based on very little evidence. Okay, is there another question at the microphone? Uh, when you think about getting started, you mentioned the things that are mundane that we do every day. Is that a good place maybe to start if we're trying to venture into this getting a voice? Do we take a look around ourselves and look at something that we do every day as perhaps a good way to launch into it? It absolutely is. When you look at, for instance, Sarah Schultz, uh, her family, they farm, um, I think they do canola and wheat out here somewhere. And she'll talk about what her husband deals with on a day-in and day-out basis with respect to policy, but then she'll talk about the recipe she made for her kids. And it humanizes what we do. It shows they're spraying these compounds, you know, their children are there living on that space. Um, it, it 
makes a lot of very important cognitive connections that help people appreciate, here's someone who's a lot like me, feeding her family and still engaging farming. How bad can it be? And so that's where these, that's where these kinds of things are really important, those kinds of personal messages. And then how do we grow our network and our sphere of influence? Is that something we need to actively do or does it just sort of organically, I use the word uh, carefully, but organically happen? Yeah, it's both. Um, so you, you, you develop a following by creating reliable content, trusted content, and by doing it on a regular basis. You have to make it a part of your job. And I tell this to faculty and, and early career scientists. Part of your job should be to sit down for 15 minutes a week and create some content that can be used. It maybe takes a little longer. But, but regularly create content. The other thing is regularly share content. If people realize that they can look at your Twitter feed or your professional Facebook page and find information from you and from others that's good, that you're a trusted catalog of other people's information, now you become somebody they follow because they ever, no one has time. And in streamlining their time, they look for trusted sources of news, of, of other information in their area. You can be that trusted source. Maybe even more trusted because of who you are and what you do and why you do it. So it, it develops on its own. And then, do you have to take it beyond social media to the curling rink, uh, the school play, <laughs> the uh, church meeting? You know, do you have to be consciously doing that at those places as well? And, and many people are uncomfortable stepping into those situations. So it's not something you have to do. But if you do do it, you'll be surprised at who shows up. And if you say, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the current state of this kind of uh, technology or the current state of you know, how this commodity is, 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 serve, is serving our community, you'll get a few people showing up. And, and, and then they become, uh, the, you tell two people, then those two tell two people, and then it becomes this growing thing, this growing organism, this network. So you can't underestimate the power of a small gathering um, to really change something. I, I spoke at a, at a horrible, I was on a panel, a panel of one of these anti-GMO movies a few years ago, and the room, after they got done shouting at me and calling me a witch and a Monsanto shill and all the stuff they did, eight people came up after and said, we'd like to know more. And then I took them out for pizza and beer and changed their minds. So it's about getting into those situations, even if they seem hostile, because the people who came with me were people in that blue portion of the body. Now I had their trust, and, and that's what we need to do. So even in those everyday conversations that happen. Oh, we've got one more last question and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Yes, hi. I am Tim Kalinowski. I'm the editor of Ag Matters magazine. Uh, just uh, the problem with social media a lot of the time, and I study this constantly in my job, is that we create an echo chamber effect where you can, and all your friends can agree on something but nobody else agrees with you, and therefore nothing moves on in terms of the dialogue. How do we avoid that echo chamber effect? Yeah, you, but that's where you have to escape. The, 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 that's a similar concept to tribes, right? There's echo chambers and tribes, people sharing the same messages. And psychology shows that they reinforce themselves and keep new ideas out, and all kinds of things like this. You have to deliberately be sharing those messages outside of the tribe. You have to be getting more, you have to be stepping actively into other tribes and, and sharing messages. Um, challenging people inside the echo chamber when it needs to be challenged. And, and that's really important. Um, like again, preaching to the choirs is important, but it's also going to be taking that message outside. All right, well, thank you for answering our questions. I know there's a lineup of media people wanting to talk to you, but are you going to be around here for a little bit? I will be around all day today, so okay. let's so, talk more. Perfect. On behalf of Farming Smarter, thank you very much, Kevin. We really appreciate it. Your, uh, thank you.